Well, I don't know if you know, but I'm well on my way to buying my first property. So I'm uh, <laughs> something of an expert. So if you want to know all the things that I wish I knew before attempting to buy a property, keep watching. Hello and welcome to The Adult Life, where we give you the tools to be a happy and healthy adult. My name is Simi and I'm the adult in charge. So like I said, I'm in the middle of buying my first property and I'm not an expert, but there are quite a few things I wish I had known before buying. So I'm hoping I can help you so you don't make the same mistakes. And let me tell you, if I'd known some of these things, it would have saved me a lot of stress and strife. So these are the 10 things I wish I knew before getting a mortgage. So the first thing I wish I knew is that London isn't everything. Now don't get me wrong, London is one of the most amazing cities to live in the world, but my people need to be freed from its shackles because you'll learn bonded. Now, I've lived in London for a long period of time and I couldn't imagine leaving it for anything, just to live in the sticks, in the middle of nowhere where there's no diversity and there's no things to do. So I get it. But since I started looking for a place to live, I realized that though I do go out and I go to restaurants and everything, it's not something I do every day. So there's actually nothing wrong with me going to a show and then taking a train to a bit further outside. I'm talking about places in zone nine or even a commuter belt that has good links to where you go most often. So I'm sure most Londoners can agree that going to a place with all awkward links would probably take you the same amount of time to get to a place just outside London. So the next thing I wish I thought I knew is that you're going to need a lot more money than you initially thought. I'm not even joking, it's one thing after another. If I speak to the vendor, if I speak to the solicitor, if I speak to the estate agent, money is leaving my account in some way. It's absolutely ridiculous, so you have to make sure you have a good side fund for all of the extras that you have to pay for. I think the problem is a lot of us are hyper focused on the deposit because it's usually a huge amount of money, but we forget all the other things that we have to pay for as well, like valuations and home buyers report, even things like cleaning services and moving in, all of that costs money. And then there's the solicitors. Whew. Solicitors have got me going crazy. So the initial quote that the solicitor gives you is, not too bad looking usually maybe like six seven hundred for the solicitor's fees and then they've got some you know land fees that are not from the solicitor but from the government and you think okay it's just a, just over a grand i can do it but then every single thing additional to that is extra money so let's say that you are buying a leasehold extra cash. if you're using a lease or help to buy isa extra cash if you're getting a gifted deposit extra cash if you want to exchange and complete on the same day extra cash so definitely be thinking of all the money that you need to spend and double it. So the next thing I was showing you is that offers aren't binding. When I first started my house search process, I was looking at different properties and having a look and I was really worried about making an offer and something I liked because I was like, oh, if I make an offer, it's going to be binding and I can't pull out. But actually, you can hand out as many offers as you like because no one's really checking. Now, I'm not saying that you should go around handing out offers like candy. But what I am saying is that, especially in these times where it's a seller's market and houses are flying off the shelves, it would probably be better for you to make an offer on a property that you really like and can see yourself following through on, but not necessarily that you absolutely love and you have to move into right now because otherwise you might not find your house for a long time. Next, we're gonna talk about solicitors again, but this time it's not their fault. And that's because hiring a solicitor can be a bit mad. So the thing about solicitors is that you actually need them surprisingly early on in the process. So as soon as you've had your offer accepted, the estate agent will ask for your solicitor so they can start for the business. But the problem is your mortgage lender might only have a certain panel of solicitors that they work with. So if your solicitor isn't on that panel, you might have to pay extra or you might have to get another solicitor. So it's a bit of a catch 22 because you need to find a property before you apply for the mortgage. But then if you get rejected from the mortgage that you're applying for, you might have to go for another lender who won't accept your solicitor. But if you haven't paid them, it's usually fine and they'll close the case for you. But if you've already asked them to start work, you might be out a bit of money, which is not the best really, especially because there's a lot more money that you need to spend further on down the road. So this almost happened to me, but luckily they hadn't started any work, but, but it was more stress and more trouble than I really needed at that time. So the next thing I wish I knew is that your property could be overpriced, especially if it's a new build. No shade. So before a lender offers you a mortgage, they're gonna send a guy around who's gonna calculate how much they think that the house is worth. But if the bank says that the house that you offered 300K for is only worth 250K, you're gonna to have to make up the difference yourself. So the bank will give you a mortgage of 90 or 95% of what they think the property's worth, so the 250K, and then you have to cover the remaining 50K by yourself. So this might not be so much of an issue if the difference between your valuation and the bank's valuation is just something like 5K, or if it's at the top of your affordability so you can afford to get a bigger loan. But I don't know many people with 10, 20, or even 50K lying around. And if you do, can you ask them if they're accepting friend applications? <laughs> 
that's good for me. So the next thing I will show you is that the LTV isn't set in stone. The LTV means low to value ratio and it's basically directly correlated to how much deposit you're putting in. So if you have a 10% deposit, your LTV is 90%. Simple? Simple. The higher your LTV, the more interest you pay because it's more risky for the bank to lend you bigger amounts. And the reason why LTV can be tricky is because at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of lenders cut their LTV to 80%. So if you didn't have a 20% deposit, you weren't able to buy. And that didn't matter whether your loan was for 200k or for 500k. So it's really important you know this before you apply to certain lenders because it's just another hoop that you have to jump through to make your life even more difficult. Next is LTI. So I know a lot of people have heard of LTV, but do you know what LTI is? You might know it as the multiplier. So it's basically how many multiples of your salary that a bank will lend to you. Usually the high street banks lend up to 4.5 times, but there are some people that go up to 5.5 and even six times if your salary is high enough. And that means that your salary is the biggest limiter of how much of a house you can buy. So if you wanna buy a house worth 500K and you have the 50K for the 10% deposit, if you earn something like 30K, the maximum house you could probably purchase is about 185K, which is a far cry from the 500K you thought you could buy with a 50K deposit. So this is usually the biggest limiter when people are trying to buy a property. And it's the main reason why people tend to buy together so that they can use both incomes and increase the multiplier by even more. The next thing is interest. So like I said, when I was talking about LTVs, interest rates depend on a lot of things. And one of them is how much of a loan you're gonna get. But it can also depend on other things like if you've got good credit. So if you've got CCJs and bankruptcies on your credit file, it's highly likely that most high street lenders won't lend to you. And the ones that will are usually subprime or adverse credit lenders. And obviously because having a bad credit report means that you're more of a risk, the interest that you'll find will be a lot higher than what you see on the high street. So it's better for your credit report to be clean and crisp before you apply. And obviously different banks have different rates, so you might wanna shop around before you choose. The next thing I wish I knew is that different mortgage lenders have very different criteria. But it's surprising to see just how different each lender is from the next one. So some have a maximum LTI of 4.5, some will take commission and bonuses into consideration, some need you to be out of your probation, and some don't mind if you've only just started. So there's a world of different criteria for each lender. So you definitely need to check each one and make sure that the one that you're applying to is the one that's best for your situation. So if you don't just have one job and one salary like a normal person, it will probably do you a world of good to speak to a whole of market broker, or in some cases, a specialist broker to help you get the best lender for your situation. And the last thing I wish I knew is that loans reduce your affordability. From all the checks that the banks do, like the LTI and all the different criteria they have, they also have something called affordability, which is making sure that you can afford the mortgage payments as part of your normal day-to-day -day spending. So if you have dedicated outgoings, it could actually reduce the amount that a lender is willing to lend you, even if you have the right LTI or if you meet the other criteria that they have. So if you have things like debt, loans and other finance agreements, you might find that the bank is actually willing to lend you a little bit less than you initially thought. In fact, I've heard that for every £100 of money that you have going out to debt, the bank reduces the amount that they want to lend you by £5,000. <sighs> That's a lot. That's a whole lot. But it's not even just loans. If you have a stay-at-home spouse or kids or any other dependents, that could also reduce the amount that the bank is willing to lend you. It just gets worse and worse, to be honest. Do you hear that? It's time for the bonus tip. <laughs> okay, so I've given you a lot of information that I wish I knew, some of them I did actually know before, but I didn't just know how much of an effect it could have on the house buying process. And my last tip is basically to help you from your dreams being crushed. And that is to not get too attached to the house that you want to purchase. So there's so many moving parts when it comes to buying a house that it could all fall down at any single moment. Even if you do everything that you need to do correctly, the bank could mess up, your solicitor could mess up, the vendor could mess up, and your dreams will be crushed. And we really don't want that, do we? So until you sign on the dotted line and you know for certain that that house is yours, detach yourself mentally to save yourself from heartbreak. So those are the 10 things, plus the bonus tip, that I wish I knew before applying for a mortgage. So let me know down in the comments, how many did you already know? And how many did you just find out about? Well, that's all for this video. Until next time, see ya.